begin what is truly the most holy and special week that God has ever designed. The Sunday to Sunday that we call Holy Week begins with Palm Sunday, ends with Easter Sunday. And it is the last week of Jesus' life on earth, a week in which he started by entering into Jerusalem. And churches all over the world today are celebrating Palm Sunday today with plays and pageantry. And many years ago, when I was a child, they would gather all the children at the back of the, con- at the in the lobby and give us all little palm things, and we'd all come in saying, Hosanna, waving our palms, because we wanted to express the joy of Palm Sunday. We wanted to express what was going on to kick off this holiest of weeks. Others might also use this time to describe and go back into the Old Testament and look at the 120 some odd prophecies that Jesus fulfilled during this week. This week is the most prophetically fulfilling week in Jesus' life, of the things that he said, of the things that he did, even of the riding in on the colt and the donkey into the city gates. And when Jesus rode in, he was proclaiming to all, that he was the king. He was using symbols of the Jewish people. He was using symbols of the Roman army so that anybody who was watching could see at least what he was trying to portray, what he was trying to put across, whether they believed it or not, was between them and God, but he was definitely making a clear statement that he was a conquering king that he was a king that comes in peace to a city already conquered by the army, that he was a king that could not be disposed. Yet there are those who woke up this morning and today was just another Sunday. And the idea of a holy week or a week that should be set aside for the celebration and worship of God is, is unknown to them. And next Sunday, the only purpose it will be will be to open mounds and mounds and mounds of chocolate candies so that they can enjoy the moment and then regret it later. Easter is not the uh, most chocolate that is eaten. That is still uh, Valentine's Day, in case you're wondering, that we still express love to one another with chocolate. But yet, gifts and candies will be a great part of this day of Easter. But as we start this week and as we look at Jesus Christ, I would like to go past all these things and look at this person of Jesus Christ, this person that has come to give himself, and who is he, and why did he come There was a plan from eternity past. God created Adam and Eve knowing that they would eat of the fruit. Omniscient, omnipotent God knew what he was doing. And even though we can say, well, if I was God, I wouldn't have done that. That's a dangerous thing to say because God's plans are better than our plans. And if I was in charge of the universe, I don't think it would have lasted these thousands of years. Anyway, I would have throwing it into the sun or something, if I was in charge of it all. But God knows what he's doing. And Adam and Eve had sinned. And that didn't catch God by surprise, because Jesus Christ, the eternal Son, was destined, was planned to be the sacrifice for humanity from eternity past. And so when Adam and Eve sinned and they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. There is even a prophecy given to Eve at that time that her seed would crush Satan's head, which is what happened on the cross. And so 
even thousands of years before Jesus Christ and thousands of years since Jesus Christ on the cross, we can see this line through Scripture of what we call God's redemptive thread, where every time the Jewish people would mess up and God would redeem them somehow, would straighten them out, would discipline them and bring them back somehow. It was all pointing to, it was all foreshadowing, it was all a type of Christ, that everything that was done in the Old Testament is called in the book of Hebrews a shadow of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And since Jesus Christ has gone to the cross 2,000 years ago, that truth has remained in granite. No one has been able to make a better offer. No one has been able to change it. No one has been able to correct it. So that the hope that the disciples had on that first Easter morning, we can have today. That if there are difficulties, if there are problems, if your life is not working out, ultimately Jesus Christ is the fix of it all if not to just get you into the kingdom of heaven and to give you a proper mindset, a proper view of the world, so that when you turn on the TV, when you get these phone calls asking how you're going to vote, all these things that are happening in this very exciting and interesting time that we are in, you see is really minuscule and insignificant compared to what you have in Jesus Christ Jesus Christ came to earth, God incarnate. There is a joke that goes around that people talk about and even seminary students play with it of, can God create a rock too big to lift? It is a logical conundrum because we cannot conceive of such a large rock and we cannot conceive of an omnipotent God not being able to lift something, and that is dismissed as against God's nature, that God can do anything that is within his logical nature. But when you look at Jesus Christ, we never joke about this, but talk about an impossibility, talk about something that no human can ever conceive of, talk about something that if you were God, you would not have done it this way, sending your Son, God incarnate, to become flesh, to walk this earth, and that Jesus Christ, willing to, for the first time in all eternity, to be hungry. God does not have to eat. God's stomach does not growl. And Jesus Christ, in all of eternity, has never had those stomach pains saying, feed me. When he was a little baby, he did. And as he grew, he was weary for the first time. He was dirty for the first time. He stepped on a rock and hurt his foot for the first time. He had problems with his family. He had problems with the neighborhood for the first time in all of eternity. you got to remember that God never had problems with the neighborhood before he created human beings. But once he created us and he sent Jesus down... It was nothing, according to the Gospels, but conflict with a Pharisee or a tax collector or people who were sick or diseased and people were always coming to him and he was surrounded by problems and difficulties, not difficult for God, but all the world's difficulties were pressed upon him as he walked the earth for the first time in all of eternity. He was too hot. He was too cold. And he was just right for the first time in all of eternity. For the first time in all of eternity, God had to wear a jacket because it was too cold in the Middle East. And we minimize this and say, oh, but Jesus just came and walked the earth. But for the first time in his life, he had to take a bath because he was dirty. For the first time, he had to put on clothes to look like us. And when you consider the 
mind-blowing impossibility, the unimaginable possibility of God reducing himself to be like us, but yet not reducing himself in deity at all. Still 100% God and 100% man. If you look at other religions, the only religion that had God making an appearance is the Hindus. Vishnu, in theory, made an appearance several hundreds of years ago in a person named Krishna. If you want to know where the name Krishna came from, that the Beatles sing about. It is the avatar or the projection of Vishnu. Vishnu couldn't become a human, so Vishnu made a projection. Today we would call it a hologram of a human being and spoke through this hologram. They couldn't even, in making up a religion, think so out of the box as to have an incarnation. And that thought alone really points to the uniqueness and the truth of Christianity, is that if you look at what Jesus Christ did, nobody could have ever thought of this. Nobody would ever come up with this, because it is so strange and so wonderful. Jesus had the name Jesus. Jesus is a Greek name. Uh, today we have names that are different in different languages. My name is Michael, but in Mexico I would be Miguel. And so in the same way, Jesus had a Greek name, but his Hebrew name, probably what his parents called him, was actually Joshua or Yeshua. That is the Hebrew form of Jesus, and that literally means God is my salvation. So even in the name that Jesus was given, he was given a name that was pointing to what he was doing. He was given a name that was pointed to who he was. We call him Jesus Christ. Christ is a Greek word that comes from the Hebrew word Messiah which literally means anointed by God, or picked by God, blessed by God. And so when we say Jesus Christ, we are saying God who saves, who is picked by God to be our salvation. He was anointed by God and sent as a little baby. And he grew, and on Palm Sunday, he came through the gates to announce who he was. But is this just a random date? But we now consider Palm Sunday and Easter. Did God just pick a, a random date? Why didn't he come on Christmas? You know, be born and die on the same day. That'd be kind of coincidental. But no, he picked this date. And what does this mean on the Jewish calendar? Well, on the Jewish calendar, this week is known as Passover week. Passover of the Holy Week, Passover would be on Thursday. Jews have been observing Passover since Moses, and they keep meticulous calendars. So we can overlay our calendar on the Jewish calendar and know that this is exactly the date and time that Jesus died. We are kind of Unsure, We question a bit that Jesus was actually born on December 25th because there's no records of that, but we know exactly what day he died and when holy, the first Holy Week occurred because it is tied to the Jewish Passover and the Jews know when their Passover is. Passover was given by Moses and it was a thermometer, a barometer of the spiritual state of Israel. As Israel got kings and split into two kingdoms, you see prophets being sent. And if a king was commanding a national observance of Passover, they were considered a righteous king. They were considered a king that was doing things right by God. But if you were like Ahab the worst king of them all. Passover wasn't even a second thought. Didn't even think about it. And so when Elijah came and reestablished things, one of the first things that were done 
after Ahab and Jezebel were killed was that they celebrated Passover as a sign of, of returning to God. Of course, the northern kingdom never did and was destroyed by the Assyrians. Now, the point of Passover, if you're doing the Lent readings, you're about the part now where uh, the angel of death comes. And if you had taken a sheep and you had taken the blood of the sheep and put it on your doorpost, the angel of death would pass over you and go after some Egyptians. You would then take that sheep and have a, a hurried meal, if you will, uh, with eating the sheep and eating some vegetables and eating some things quickly because you are about to exit. And even today, uh, coming up on whenever Passover is this year, Jews all over the world will be reenacting at their dinner table the Passover meal. They will get dressed up to leave, and they will, they will eat a meal hurriedly. They will probably go buy lamb from Lucky's, but it will be a reenactment, and they do it every year. And back in the time of Jesus, it took eight days for you to prepare the Passover meal because you had to get the sheep, and you had to arrange places to do it. And so the Passover celebration in the Old Testament is actually talked about as an eight-day celebration. So you have Sunday, Palm Sunday, to Sunday, Easter, eight days. So even when we celebrate the Easter season and the Holy Week, we celebrate it for eight days, Sunday to Sunday. And when Jesus was arrested on Thursday night, Friday morning, and he was taken, he had already celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples, and he was executed, he was sacrificed, he was murdered by the Roman people and the Jewish people, and God took him and made him the universal, eternal Passover lamb, so that when John is given a vision of future heaven, and nobody can open the scroll, and he says, who will open the scroll? And he sees a lamb who was slaughtered. He sees Jesus Christ, that even that late date, for all eternity, Jesus Christ will be known as, Jesus Christ will be displayed as, Jesus Christ will be understood as the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb of God, who died for the sins of the world. As Jesus moves toward Easter, he moves out of the upper room and he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, the Garden of Gethsemane was an olive grove and had an olive press where olive oil comes out of. And Gethsemane literally means intense press. And Jesus was under intense pressure praying because he didn't like the fact that he was going to the cross. He saw what it was going to be, and he didn't want to do it. And so he prayed, Lord, remove this cup from me. And we can, we can speed over that and go, yeah, the cup is pain or the cup is something. But what is the cup full of? Uh, I returned from a pastor's conference two weeks ago, and Paul Washer, who was the mission speaker, told the story of going to a Scottish uh, parochial Calvinist school in uh, Geneva, and he was going to teach, and he thought that it was going to be high school students, but he gets there, and it's fifth graders, and he talks to the headmaster, and he says, but I'm going to preach on propitiation. And the guy said, that's no problem. So that's a good school. So he's talking to the class of fifth graders, and he asked the question, what was in the cup that Jesus did not want to drink? And a little fifth grade girl raises her hand, and she stands up and stands next to her desk at attention and says, sir, the cup was full of the wrath of God. And that's right. The cup is full of the wrath of God. Jesus Christ did, in fact, take on all your sin, past, present, and future, and it was put on him. 
And for him to forgive your sins, it has to be like the sin was done to him from you. And so when you are verbally abusive to somebody, what Jesus experienced on the cross was you being verbally abusive to him. All these sins, uh, the Census Bureau says that there's been about 79 billion people alive in our world. There's about 7.23 billion alive now. Take that by how many sins do you commit a day? Trillions of sins since Adam and Eve to the last person were put on Jesus individually. He knew who they were, who committed them, what the sins were, and he felt them. And then when all these sins were placed on Jesus, the Bible says, He who knew no sin became sin. Jesus was so full of our sin, he in essence became our sin. God opened the floodgates of heaven and blasted him with white hot wrath that had never been seen. You think the flood was wrath? You think Sodom and Gomorrah was wrath? Those were nothing compared to what was poured onto Jesus Christ because the wrath had to punish and take care of every last sin that had ever been committed on earth and ever will be committed. And when that was all done, Jesus Christ, probably in more horrific pain and misery than you will ever experience, gave his spirit to God and died. And when he died, that blood that he shed was applied to your sin. And this offer was made to the whole world. And it is still made today. Nobody has beat this offer. Nobody has changed this offer. That if you want your sins taken care of, you accept Jesus Christ. And when you accept Jesus Christ, the events on the cross are applied to your life. And there will be a time when Jesus Christ is done with us. When he's done with this world that is rejecting him and slapping him and misusing his name and he's going to sit on a throne. And one by one, each of those 79 billion people, as somebody said once, won't that take a long time? My response is, Jesus has all the time in the world. He can take as long as he wants. One by one, he will have a conversation with everybody who comes. And books will be opened of the works that we do. This is in Revelation 19 and 20. And then a second book will be opened. That's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And if you have during this life turned your life over to Jesus Christ, applied what he has done to you, then your name will be read by an angel out of that book and you get to go into heaven. You get to go into the wedding feast. You get to go and be with Christ for all eternity. Yet if it is not there, if you have spent your life rejecting Christ, then all that pain and wrath and misery that he experienced gets put on your sin. You get to pay for your own sin. And what that means, because we can never pay for our own sin, it means eternity in the lake of fire. Several theologians, all the way back to Spurgeon, have interpreted from Scripture that because it is Christ that you are rejecting, because it is his work that is being rejected, it will be Christ who will design the punishment for your sin in the lake of fire. And Christ for all eternity will make sure that you pay for your sins because you rejected what he did on the cross. But if you accept what's on the cross... He freely, because he loves you more than you can ever imagine, freely welcomes you into heaven and you will spend eternity with him. And that is what this Holy Week means. And because of this, 
We are going to get together on Thursday night at 6.30. We're going to have a very simple soup supper. Bring your favorite soup if you have one. And we will celebrate communion. And we will celebrate what Christ did. We will look at what Christ did in the upper room with his disciples before he went to the cross. And then on Easter Sunday, because we are not the type to get up at sunrise like some churches, we're going to have a breakfast at 9.30. So there will be no Sunday school, but come and fellowship with the people of the church at 9.30, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This week is truly, in God's mind, the most important week of the calendar year. Compared to the other 51, it stands above, it shines, it is glory, because it is the point of why Christ came. It is because it shows His love, unlike anything else, and it is holy week. It is a week that is set aside, it is a week that is set above, so that you can mess around all 51 weeks of the year, but when you get to this week, I think we need to pay attention. I think we need to be in our Bibles. I think we need to be in church. As pastors have posted all over Facebook, if nothing else, go to church this week, because this week salvation is going to be preached, Christ is going to be preached, and you're going to have an opportunity like none other to enter the kingdom of God. And so I bring to you Holy Week, and I pray that it not be another week. There will be many people who will get up tomorrow, and it will be like Palm Sunday never existed, and they'll just enter the grind, and they'll hate their job, and they'll yell at their family, and all the stuff that people do. And the idea that Christ came, lived a perfect life, and died for your sins, and it's a free gift. It's a free offer. Anybody can do it. It will be meaningless to them. And that's sad because Christ loved us so much. He died and went through enough so that everybody on earth could be saved. But sadly, Jesus said, narrow is our way, wide is the way to destruction. Stay on the narrow way this week. Stay on the narrow way. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I just praise your name that there is a way out, that there is a way to avoid your white hot wrath that is going to be shown at the end of the age. And that way is Jesus Christ. Lord, I praise you that Jesus Christ went against all convention and became a man and walked among us and then as a man, as God, died on the cross so that we may have forgiveness for all of our sins, past, present, and future. Lord, I pray that this truth will be preached from the rooftops this week, that people may know that you are the God who is on the throne and that you are going to judge someday. Lord, I praise you for all these things, and I ask your blessing upon this church and upon all who are here today. Amen.